<laughs> Hi. Hi, I have a very special guest, and it's not an owl, but a former NASA astronaut. Take a look. Alright, Dr. Donald, can you please uh, tell us a bit about yourself? Okay, my name is Don Thomas. I'm a former NASA astronaut, and I had the amazing opportunity to fly on four space shuttle missions. I was on Space Shuttle Columbia three times and Discovery once. I've spent 44 days in space, and during that time I went around the Earth 692 times. I was an astronaut for 17 years. I worked at NASA for 20 years total. The first three years I was an engineer working on the Space Shuttle program. And I retired from NASA 11 years ago and have been working in the field of education. Dr. Don, if you could go back into space right now, what's the one thing you would make sure to do? If I could go back into space, and if I could go anywhere I wanted to go, I would go to the moon. Right. As a young boy, I wanted to see the Earth as a round ball, the size of a soccer ball, uh, in, in the blackness of space, just that blue ball there. So to see the Earth from that perspective, I would love, love to see that. If I went up to space, just in the space shuttle orbiting the Earth, the one thing that I would try to do is maybe do a space walk. Mm -hmm. I never had the opportunity to do that. I was trained to go outside if there was a problem, but that never happened on my missions. Uh, so that's the one thing that I would do is maybe see if I could do a spacewalk. But I really love it. I wish I could have gone to the moon. And for the reason of looking back and just seeing the Earth from that perspective, I think that would be just an awesome sight. Sure. The other question I have is, what do you think of Elon Musk? And do you think he'll get us to Mars? You know, Elon Musk is doing an incredible job. Uh, he is a great innovator, uh, he's a great leader, and what he's doing with the technology with rockets, he's taking it beyond what NASA's doing. I was in Florida when he landed his first, first stage back on Earth. This was, I can't remember, three years ago. And I watched the launch, it was a nighttime launch, and then I watched the first stage come back down, and it landed, and I said, I have just seen history. This is history, you know, because this is the way it's going to be in the future. And I was excited by that. Uh, a few months ago, when he launched his first Falcon Heavy rocket, and he had two first stage rockets coming back down, simultaneous, landing perfectly. You know, they showed the employees yelling and screaming. They were so excited. And I thought, this, this is incredible. So he's doing a, a great job of pushing the technology from what NASA was doing. NASA learned to reuse the space shuttle. Elon Musk is taking it that next step yes. as well. Right. So will he get to Mars? I don't think there's a competition between Elon Musk and NASA to get to Mars first. I'm, I'm not sure Elon Musk will get to Mars and build a Mars colony all on his own. I don't know anybody who's got that kind of money. It's very expensive. So I would guess that the best approach would be Elon Musk and NASA and other countries working together to get human beings to Mars. It doesn't have to be SpaceX first or NASA first. It could be, it should be humans, Earthlings going to Mars. So get the, the Russian Space Agency, the European Space Agency, the UAE Space Agency, all the Chinese, get them all working together on, on a program to send humans to Mars. I think that would be the best way. Of all the problems and poverty in the world, why do you feel it's important to send, I mean, to spend money on space travel? Yeah, that's a classic question for an astronaut. Okay. If there's one person hungry on Earth, how can you justify sending a rocket up? The hardest question you can ask an astronaut. But humans, what we do in all of our cultures, you know, we, we do different things here on Earth. We spend some of our money on education. We spend some of our money, all governments do this, we spend some of our money on militaries. We spend some money on arts, on music, and just paintings and sculpture. So all civil civilizations do these multiple things. And you cannot just stop everything that's going on and take the money and try to feed all the homeless. Because it, it won't solve all the problems here on Earth. So what we do, we set priorities. Some of the money goes to education. Some of the money goes to the Department of Defense for our 
you know, for our armies. Uh, some of the money goes to the arts. Some of it goes to NASA for exploration. Some of it goes to science, you know, for researchers. And we set our priorities and we try to balance it all out. It doesn't mean we don't care about the hungry. It doesn't mean we don't care about the homeless. You know, they should all be, everybody should have a home, everybody should have food, everybody should have medical care. So we're, we're, we're striving for that. But I don't think you can take all the money, throw it at one problem, uh, because you have all these other problems going on. So we try to have a balance with all of that. Most of right? Have you seen space junk and how that is a problem? Space debris is, is a problem in space. You hear a lot about it. And if you ever saw a map, that they make of the space junk, you'll see there's tens of thousands of, of pieces of space junk orbiting the Earth, and it looks horrible. Sure. Uh, the, the real facts are, like everything bigger than the size of my fist, we track the orbit of that with radar from Earth. Okay. So anything bigger than my fist, we know where that object is around the Earth. And if it should be getting close to the space station or our space shuttle, we can fire some engines and separate ourselves to make sure we miss. So those aren't a problem. And these, the space junk is old rocket stages, old satellites that have burned out, maybe a tool from an astronaut that floated away. These are all what we call space junk. Anything smaller than my fist, yeah, we have no idea where it is. Okay. So bigger things we can track, right. anything smaller, we have no idea. But the good news is it's a low probability. It's a very low probability of you and some particle being at the exact same spot at the exact same moment. Because all this space debris is in different orbits, at different altitudes, in different orientations, and it's a low probability. We have hit things with the space shuttle. On two of my missions, uh, in our windows, we got hit by a small particle that left a little crater in the window. Okay. Not, not a crack, but a little crater. Just a millimeter deep, maybe a millimeter across. And you can see a little a ray pattern, like a crater on the moon, where whatever hit us vaporized and right. deposited on the window. On my last mission, I was looking out the window having lunch, looking at the Earth. And I saw a little round dot on the window. And I thought it was some of the juice I was drinking. So I took a napkin, I went to clean up the juice, and it didn't disappear. And I went a little closely at it, and it was a little crater in the window. So something had hit us, maybe not at that moment, I don't know when it happened, but all of a sudden I noticed it. And at a low sun angle, during sunrise or sunset on the shuttle, I could see that ray pattern. And that was very large, you know, 10, 15 centimeters across that you could see whatever hit us vaporized. And they did some analysis afterwards. They found out uh, they thought it was a flake of paint mm -hmm. that hit us. And it just reminds you, there is space debris out there. Right. And when it's traveling at 27,000 kilometers an hour or faster, it, it, even a small particle has a lot of kinetic energy and you can do a lot of damage. So we never worry about it too much, but sometime, just from probability, one of our spacecraft, one of our space stations, gonna, it's going to get hit by some particle.